Welcome to this topic on pain in the young. It's a big topic. People are, um, some people consider pediatric pain as a same as pain control in the adults except used less and it and it's not that way um, with my anesthetic hat on I remember in my training thinking that um, uh, pediatrics were or kids were just small adults and they're not and I think that's the first thing to stress when dealing with pediatrics in any in any in any way um, but particularly in pain it's not the same thing as treating pain in an adult and we need to we need to bear that in mind some of us won't come across pediatric pain management that often but it's important to be aware or to have the basics and fundamentals of pediatric pain management as well as to be aware of the differences between um, uh, the young pain and old pain um, so let's move on this is the way um, well actually let me say differences between young pain and old pain well old pain is completely different to um, adult pain as well which is something that will be discussed elsewhere so there are three types of pain there's the pediatric pain there's the adult pain and then there's the pain in the elderly and they're all different um, so th so let's move on so pediatric pain this is the way we're going to structure this talk we're going to look at the neurobiology of pediatric pain and that's important we have to understand what the differences are between young pain and adult pain. We're going to get an approach on pain assessment in the young as well and how do we assess people that can't really talk to us or how do we assess people that don't really see the world the way we see the world. An approach to pain management, the challenges that occur in pediatric pain management and I just wanted to briefly um, stir the pot by mentioning anesthetic agents and neurodegeneration and, and um, analgesics that we use. So the neurobiology of pain, oh no, we haven't got there yet, we're still introducing things. So, fantastic pictures, Leonardo da Vinci, early 1500s. I just wanted you to spend a couple of minutes just looking at these pictures. Now the picture on my left um, shows a fetus curled up and this was, this was these, are, these are actual papers from Leonardo da Vinci. And the, the, so the picture on the left shows how fascinated he was with a fetus being curled up and how it could uh, could fit into a uterus. And the one on the right shows a breech fetus um, wrapped up in the uterus with a cord wrapped around the legs. And if you have a look at the smaller pictures, he shows how the layers of the uterus actually open up like the petals of a flower. So phenomenal pictures done in the 1500s by Leonardo da Vinci, who was, anatom who was an anatomist way before his time. And this, is what he, and this is what he said in his writing. I'm going to read it. And one of the same souls govern these two bodies. And one and the same souls govern these two bodies. And desires, fears, and pains are common to this creature as to all other animated parts. Pains are common to this creature. We'll come back to that in a little while. That was in the 1500s. And then what happened between then and now was not very much, or this century, not very much as, as all regarding the neurobiology of pain or understanding pain in the young, in the newborn, in the neonate. So just a whole lot of space happened. And I draw your attention to this um, presentation given by um, David Chamberlain in 1991 at an international symposium on circumcision. And he gave quite a quite a, uh, a, a biting um, presentation on, on babies and how babies don't feel pain and how we've been in a century of denial in medicine and he, he mentioned a number of the papers that really showed us how awful um, neonates and babies were treated with regards to pain and how it has been suggested and thought that young, the young don't feel pain. So you can find this on the internet, it's, it'll come up as one of the first search engines, and I, uh, one of the first in the search engines, um, and you've got the reference to this as well, but it's quite an interesting read, and it gives you quite a good overview on how we have neglected neonatal pain management for so long, until only so recently. This is an example of some of the papers, and these are high quality papers, peer-reviewed papers, published in journals, 
in the 1930s, they would um, one of the one of the experiments they would do is uh, put cylinders on babies' abdomens, video them, and run water with different temperatures of different temperatures through the cylinders on the abdomen, on the legs, on the forehead, and while they filmed the reactions of the babies. So as this was as the water or the, um, was made hotter or colder, babies would react. 1930s. Then in the 1940s, um, in a in a paper in the journal Child Development, uh, pin prick on infants. So they pin uh, they pricked infants, and he has an excerpt. Even when there is sensitivity, it is reasonable to assume that neural mediation does not extend above the level of the thalamus. Fantastic. Peer-reviewed journals. This is scientific stuff. Then we move on to the 70s. That wasn't a long time ago. Um, again, pinprick, and I think some of these, you know, pinprick around the knees, pinprick in various parts of the body. The normal response is movement of the upper and lower limbs, usually accompanied by grimace and or cry. So there we have a, just a very few of many experiments, and some of them by highly respected um, um, scientists and doctors, on pain in neonates. Phenomenal. Um, it just makes me wonder <laughs> what's going to be happening in 10 years' time, 30 years' time, 50 years' time, when they look back at studies and research that were done today. So Anand uh, and, and his colleague in 1987, so they were working on this for a number of years, but I think this is the guy that really changed it all for pediatrics um, and how he understood the neurobiology of, um, of the neonate and the neurobiology of the fetus and really got it out there. This was in 18, uh, 1987 uh, in the NEJM, New England Journal of Medicine. He looks very serious in this picture, but if you go onto the internet, you'll find a number of uh, YouTube video clips um, of him speaking very uh, animatedly about managing pediatric pain and how he's devoted most of his career in looking after kids. And he's an intensivist, um, and he's done a lot of work on pain management in kids. So this is probably one of the game changers with regards to pediatric pain pain in the young, pain in the newborn. So 1987. A year later, Jill Lawson presented her letter in the NEJM. So a year afterwards, in the same journal, how the story of her child unfolded and how he was managed following his premature birth. Now her child, Jeffrey Lawson, was born premature and he had surgery to repair a patent ductus arteriosus, so open heart surgery, cardiac surgery, um, and how I think he died, um, and following his death, how she found out that um, surgery was undertaken in her premature, in her premature newborn, with no anaesthetic and no analgesic. The only medication that was used in this in this premature newborn was pancuronium long-acting muscle relaxant to keep him still uh, and this is what happened in 1985 so she published this paper and there were a number of other publications in other journals particularly in the media um, beforehand but this was in 1985 now I remind you that um, Anand did his papers or his kind of big publications happened uh, a year before this 1987 so he was working on things at the same time um, and this was in 1988. Newborns were being operated on without any analgesics and anesthetics. And even to this day, the American Pain Society have the Jeffrey Lawson Award for Advocacy in Children's Pain Relief. So this, is, this was, again, the, the, the media game changer for pediatric pain, pediatric pain management. And I, and, I didn't, and I have to be honest with you, I didn't know about this stuff until I started reading up about pediatric pain. Um, uh, because it, it never got to me, it, it, no one's ever spoken to me about this, so that's why I'm, I'm getting this to you. We have to be advocates for pediatrics and pediatric pain management. Whether you're a pediatric pain specialist or not, we need to still spread the word. I just remind you again to what Leonardo da Vinci said in 1511, I think it was, 
and pains are common to this creature as to all other animated parts. It's taken so long for us to understand. And again, Leonardo da Vinci was, a, was well before his time. Um, Leonardo da Vinci, I think he drew this, the, um, the sinus of um, Valsalva, or the, the, the aortic sinuses, and I think they wanted to call it, or they proposed it should be called the sinuses of Leonardo da Vinci. Phenomenal stuff if you have an interest in anatomy to follow up on Leonardo da Vinci's, um, ex not experiments, dissections, which are amazing. So let's move on. Let's get back, back um, into pediatrics and the neurobiology of pediatric pain. So a number of really good papers out there now, really uh, crystallizing um, pediatric nociceptive circuits and what happens. And we can now safely say that about 25 weeks gestation, um, nociceptive circuitry is intact and it is possible to feel pain or for nociception to occur. That's a very neuroplastic um, nervous system and that makes sense because it is growing and changing every second of the day. Now the thing is, so it's neuroplastic, it's put together and it's working, but it's not well controlled. And that makes sense. If it's working and there's no controls, well, of course, pain can be amplified and pain can be excessive and pain can lead to long-lasting effects. The lower thresholds in the young nervous system or the young um, uh, pain pathways, the greater amplitudes of pain as well. And these are the unique features of the young neurobiology of pain and nociception. So just to reinforce a couple of things as well, they're mature fibers with immature connections. So they work, but they're not controlled, and that means they can get out of hand. They've got high levels of AMPA, high levels of NMDA, so sensitization, central neuroplastic changes that occur. There is reduced inhibition, and there are a couple of extra, there's a whole bunch of changes and tiny kind of things that are coming out in the research. It's not, it's not, it's not important to know all the minutiae of it all, but it is important to have a big picture on the young pain. And even some papers have shown that GABA and glycine in early days can be excitatory before they become inhibitory. So mature fibers, immature connections and control, excessive amplified pain. And again, just to reinforce that the behaviors are changed, the future responses are enhanced. So if you cause pain in a neonate or a young, the future, enhance, the future responses to pain are enhanced. They have a memory for pain. Perioperative analgesic requirements are increased in those that have pain, and they can get adverse long-term consequences, and that's important. Increased plasticity, amplified pain, adverse long-term consequences. And I'm going on about this, but it is important. So pain assessment in the young the same as pain assessment in the adult. Well, it's not the same thing, really. Um, it's not the same thing as having a, you know, a small adult or talking to them like they're a small adult. It's different. Same as talking to an elderly person. It's different talking to an adult. So when you talk about pain assessment in the young, you've just got to say this. It needs to be age appropriate and, con and context appropriate. That's it. So any pain assessment tool in young needs to be age appropriate, needs to be context appropriate. And before you even get onto that, you have to understand that the, the situation that you're in is unique for every situation. So there are pain factors that you need to be aware of. There are um, the factors of the children that you need to be aware of. There are parent factors that you need to be aware of. And there are factors for us and colleagues, such as healthcare staff factors. So the pain factors um, that may change your assessment, well, is it acute, is it chronic, is it cancer, is it simple pain? laceration? Is it complicated pain? Neuropathic pain following a spinal cord injury? Is it anticipated and unanticipated procedural, operative, clinical, experimental paradigm of pain? So there are pain factors that change your assessment. There are child factors, of course, the developmental age, the language, um, cognitive function. If, if, if a patient's or the child has got no cognitive function or low cognitive function, well, you need to assess them differently. If they've got past experiences, you may need to assess them differently. You need to consider social and cultural issues as well. So you've got a good list there. And of course, parent issues. You need to consider the parent when assessing the child. How am I going to discuss things with them first, during, afterwards? 
uh, what things do I need to know about the parent that may have, that may uh, change the way I assess this child and then of course the healthcare staff as well some people don't believe that anything needs to be different some people um, have different attitudes for pain and pain management uh, different wards um, promote analgesics or promote n no analgesics so you need to take this all into consideration if staff are not comfortable with dosing pediatric pain and, and pediatric um, analgesics then they may not promote them as well that makes sense so if a child is more than four they can self-report they can define what is more and less than so they can tell you my pain is more or less than previously or they've got some kind of reference point if you get more than if they get older than seven to ten years old they can define assessing versus uh, sorry ascending versus descending so they can understand the difference between ascending and descending as, as a concept 10 to 12 can can separate pain and emotion and more than 12 they have been shown to even fill the multi-dimensional pain questionnaires such as the McGill questionnaire so age appropriate context appropriate now if you go to impact.org, the initiative on methods, measurements and pain assessment in clinical trials, there is a PEED impact uh, group of papers and that's a really good paper and this defines the domains and how we should be assessing pain in children and it's quite a good read, it's open access, just go to the website and click on the PEED impact um, paper um, if you have an interest in this and if you want to supplement your reading. So this is based on PEED impact. So age appropriate, context appropriate. So this is the way we're going to look at um, pain scales in children. You've got self-report um, in children and young. So there are a number of scales that could be useful. Uh, pieces of hurt, faces revised, and then the various um, analog scores, um, numerical rating scales. So children and young people. Then if you move on to behavioral assessment, you can, you can assess behavior in those that have no cognitive impairment and then those that have cognitive impairment. So no cognitive impairment, it depends on whether they're younger or, or older than three years old. Yeah, but as you can see, some can be useful in both, such as the FLAC and um, CHEOP scores, which we'll come to. And then the children with cognitive impairment, there are only a couple of very useful um, or useful um, behavioral assessments for kids with cognitive impairment so age appropriate and context appropriate now I'm not going to go through all these assessment tools in detail but I just wanted to remind you that there are there um, slightly more detail in your reading package and as I said there are other places where you can you can elaborate on this if necessary but it's just important to have a handle on what's out there they've all been validated to a degree they've all got some useful points and they've all got some disadvantages so self-report, pieces of hurt, so they've got poker chips and the more poker chips they have, the more hurt they feel and that's been the three to four year olds. Faces pain scale revised, four to twelve years old, usually useful and initially you had the Wong Baker um, faces scale which was um, animated, cartoon like and the newer ones, the revised ones are gender neutral and um, um, are now being used over the older ones. Visual analog scores can be useful in eight and above and their advantages to some over the other. So now we're on to behavioral tools in those that don't have any cognitive impairments and you've got flack, faces, legs, arms, consolability and cry and normally you add up a bunch of scores they're normally zero to three or so on a Likert score you get a number above and below means something. Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario Pain Scale, quite a, quite a mouthful, CHEOPS. Parents Post-Operative Pain Measure, so this is for parents to assess behavior and, and um, measure pain in the post-operative or post-procedural period. And then there's the Comfort Scale, which is quite an elaborate big scale. And again, age appropriate, context appropriate, I know I'm saying it over and over again. This is looking at um, neonates. So this is behavioral tools in neonates. Premature infant pain profile. The children's revised impact of event scale, so cries. Neonatal facial coding system. And neonatal infant pain scale. 
age appropriate and context appropriate so cognitive impairment now this is so this is so this is in a cognitively impaired non communicative children's pain revised a uh, checklist revised and then the pediatric pain profile can also be used so approach to pediatric pain management child centered child friendly absolutely and now this is uh, the approach is similar to most play and um, the approach is similar and it involves a common sense approach and um, pediatric and child health division of the Royal Australasian College of Physicians are published guidelines and I'm sure there are other other colleges out there that have published guidelines into pediatric pain management um, and again I just wanted to mention a few points so get the parents involved child centered and friendly so cho so you think about the child think about the parent and then think about the staff so the staff need to be appropriately trained I'm certainly going to not do some fancy things that a pediatric pain specialist or group could manage somebody that's been trained in it don't do the most invasive procedures do the least invasive procedures use combination therapy and manage anxiety as well with pharma and non pharmacological approaches Remember, sedation is not analgesia, um, and again, all this is just common sense. We're just collating it. Now, acute pain. There are a number of things that adults manage easily without any issues, such as having bloods being taken, um, such as central venous port access. Of course, it's not comfortable for adults, and we, we use local anesthetics, but we can talk to our patients and explain to them what we're doing and why we're doing it so they're on side. You can't do that with a kid, or it's very difficult or more challenging, should I say, to do that with a child. But again, so these are the things that can cause acute pain. So capillary sampling, immunization, suprapubic aspiration, and a couple of other obvious things there. So again, just to get you into a way of thinking, managing acute pain in pediatrics. Now, I just wanted to briefly mention that there's some speci uh, specific things for pediatrics. So there's non-farm and pharmacological approaches. Lots of papers out there. But I just wanted to remind you that distraction, hypnosis are important. And the environment is a very important as well. If you put our, some kids into the hot environment where I work, uh, scare the life out of them understandably so so we're not equipped to manage those kids parent holding has been shown to be useful skin to skin contact kangaroo mother care has been shown to be useful there there ev there's evidence for and against the use of sucrose as an analgesic um, uh, there's probably a bit more evidence for it than against it breastfeeding breast milk and tissue adhesive so glues and those kinds of things can be useful the pharmacological stuff, we, we've got a handle on that, have an approach depending on the, the age, the context, uh, the, the procedure being done. Emla, nitrous oxide, so don't forget about local anesthetic techniques. And then of course you can have orals, oral medications, midazolam, it's ketamine. Remember, sedation is not analgesia, but midazolam might be useful. Um, and then the IV stuff as well. And there are multiple papers looking at specific treatments for specific procedures. And I'm sure it's not expected that you know them all. But have a handle on the differences. There's also a good recent um, paper from the ISP pain updates looking at acute pain management in newborn infants for those of you that have an interest. And then chronic pain. Um, Eccleston has published a number of papers and I don't want to go into the whole gamut of chronic pain but there are some points that I need to I need to stress the point prevalence of pain is about 15 percent which is massive if you really think about it um, it tends to occur in girls more than boys the incidence is about 14 years GPs manage most of them well and most of most of the kids if managed appropriately bounce back however if they're not managed well on an on initial therapy, you don't want them to get into that diagnostic vacuum where they just go around from specialist to specialist looking for a cause. Same as in the adults. You want to get them out of that. You want to get them to stop looking for meanings of their pain. You want to get them into that chronic kind of paradigm of education and a multiple, multidisciplinary, uh, multimodal approach to pain management. Um, 
because if they get into that that vacuum of an assessment they can really they can really get into a bad place so first line treatments yes gps if it doesn't work get them to the specialists of which there're only a handful anyway um so we as pain specialists certainly as me as a non pediatric pain specialist um i can still be a champion and if necessary um could provide some education to gps but again pediatric pain is under 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 uh, resourced we need more out there so hands up please so as i said send to the specialist early and the treatments are extrapolated from adult studies m meaning there aren't many studies looking at kids and kids pain and that's a big problem so we need more studies out there the the main pain or recurrent pains that kid, uh, pediatrics have are headaches abdominal pain so recurrent abdominal pain and musculoskeletal pain those are the big 3 don't forget about things that you may not think about with your adult hat on such as school absence social withdrawal these old big things to a teenager or a growing child Um, so a couple of important points again Eccleston is involved with pediatrics and there are a lot of papers out there and they did a systematic review looking at RCTs for psychological therapy for chronic pain in ch children and adolescents and CBT works so in kids non-farm uh, non -farm, uh, treatment approaches work CBT works uh, physiotherapy works so you don't have to chuck opioids at them and again we know that opioids are not useful and the last thing I'd want is for a child to get onto medication where they're studying they're you know they're interacting they're growing the last thing you want to do is cognitively impair them with meds um, so this so this review found that um, there was an NNT of 2.32 for 50 percent reduction in headaches using CBT super fantastic so CBT works physiotherapy those kinds of non-farm treatments work and this was reviewed again in 2010 and pretty much similar findings were found don't forget about the, the parent the hardest thing I found was that mummy couldn't make it better imagine what that feels like as a parent to watch your child suffer and have nothing you can do about it so consider your parents so the challenges to Ellen Walker from um, GOS, Great Ormond Street, uh, also done a number of excellent papers and this is a good paper and I advise you to go and have a look at this and just shows you what challenges pediatric pain specialists have. Um, so we as ch chronic adult pain specialists or pain specialists for adults have a number of challenges but the challenges are so much more uh, or so many more and um, so wider for pediatric pain. So research is a huge problem because it's not happening, it's not out there. Um, NICU pain assessment, there is no gold standard to assessing neonates in an ICU. We need to be aware of the neurobiology, so we've discussed that, that's something we could disseminate. Um, we know that early injury leads to long-term changes, so early injury leads to long-term uh, quantitative sensory changes, and they're now showing this, saying following uh, thoracotomies. Um, we don't have much on neuropathic pain in kids. We know it occurs, it's likely to occur because you've got a young nervous system that's neuroplastic with no controls, but we don't know how to treat it. We don't know much about it. What is it? What does it look like? What does it feel like? Um, and as I said, the pharmacological treatments have been extrapolated from adult studies. Okay, more, more challenges. The off-license use of drugs, need I say any more? lack of specialists mentioned that don't forget about cancer pain in kids and something called epidermolysis bullosa hugely painful uh, skin condition for kids don't forget about their functions so their sporting schooling the ability for them to interact with friends um, and of course sleep as well it's a big problem if kids don't sleep that's a problem uh, separation anxiety so from kids and their parents uh, problems with schools and learning so again you chuck in medication they're not cognitively functioning they're not um, uh, they're not concentrating they're doing badly at school the peers look at them badly and they've got their they're off school quite a lot so these are things that you need to remember and these are the, these are the challenges and of course transition to adult care they're managed by a group of specialists 
of which there are few out there, uh, in, in special teams. And then from one day to the next, they're off. They're off into the, the adult pain clinics and the adult settings where they're having their now procedures in busy adult hospitals from one day to the next. There's no transition, so that is a big problem as well, or potentially a big problem. Now let's stir the pot a little bit, anesthetic agents and neuro uh, neurodegeneration. Neurodegeneration, neurodestruction, apoptosis, programmed cell death can be caused by medications that we as pain specialists and anaesthetists use. Ketamine is a big one. Benzodiazepines, um, propofol, sorry that's not benzodiazepines, that's benzodiazepines. Propofol. Now these have all been shown in preclinical studies, so these are, have been shown in animal studies. There is no evidence to support this in, uh, in human studies yet. However, it's important to be aware of these potentials and again as I've said um, um, we look back at the studies done on kids you know, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years ago and we're frowning upon those studies. Well what about the studies done now looking back to us from the future? Can't believe those people in the good old days used ketamine and ben benzodiazepines and propofol um, when we know how destructive they are to the young human neonate. So that might be what happens in future, I don't know, but for now animal studies, yes, neurodegeneration. Human studies, not sure. Good article out there, use of anaesthetic agents in neonates and young children by Mellon and colleagues um, from 2007. If you have an interest, I'd recommend reading that. I think it's an open access paper as well. The, the neurodegeneration seems to be dose dependent and it seems to be exposure dependent so it, that might mean that if we need to use these medications and we're thinking about things from the wider perspective, limit your dose, limit your exposure. Shortest dose, shortest time. Smallest dose, shortest time. And just a brief again stir of the pot. Um, Alzheimer's like situation so the brain changes with the use of long-term administration of ketamine, there's some similar changes that occur, the neurodegenerative changes that occur, and this again is in mice and monkeys, so preclinical studies. However, there are studies out there to support some serious changes. Now, that is not a picture from the study, uh, that is just a picture I've used to illustrate um, uh, what we could be doing or what could be happening. Again, I'm not saying do or don't, we need to, but we need to bear in mind that the potential ramifications. And that brings us to the end of this paper.